So they're talking about Jesus being perfected. Uh, he said, called by, by God as high priest. <clears throat> and again, I think I said last time, maybe a previous verse, this, this is not a sinecure. He, he did not seek this office. He was uh, appointed that office by God himself. So he said, according to the order of Melchizedek, and there'd be a lot more to uh, said about Melchizedek, beginning in verse uh, in uh, chapter seven. So we'll get into it more in depth there. But he says, according to the order of Melchizedek, and by the very fact that he uh, mentions Melchizedek and what we'll learn later about him, that there can't be any doubt that uh, Jesus is, uh, he's uh, eminently qualified to act as a, a faithful and merciful high priest uh, to things pertaining to God. He received his appointment uh, directly from God, as did Aaron. You, you remember uh, Aaron, the the family of Aaron was appointed to be the uh, family from which the high priest were selected. And, of course, the tribe of Levi was the uh, tribe from which the priests were selected. And of course, Aaron was a Levite. <clears throat> this, as the Son of God, he, he occupies a rank uh, far above all created beings, and that would be uh, the family of Aaron. And is able to save to the uttermost all who come unto God through him. He has borne temptations, trials, and afflictions uh, much more than those uh, endured by any other man. Therefore, he knows how to sympathize. <clears throat> Uh, with the afflicted <clears throat> and how to support and deliver those that are tempted. He has, by his own obedience unto death, learned the necessity of a strict compliance with all the uh, requirements of divine law. Thus, uh, as a result of that, he knows how to support and save those who obey him. In verse 11, he says, he continues the thought according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom, and when he says of whom, he's probably talking about the priesthood of Christ after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say, and he does have a lot more to say about that, and hard to explain. Now, it's hard to explain, not that he can't explain it, but you have to consider his audience. You know, this, this is new to them, and so it's hard to explain to them. Also, because since you have become a dull of hearing. Now, dull of hearing means they're unable to apprehend spiritual things. And, you know, being able to apprehend spiritual things, of course, comes from a study, a meditation, prayer, and, and practice. And they apparently had... Uh, left some of these things off. <clears throat> I would say that uh, dullness of hearing and things sacred has always been a problem. In Matthew, the 13th chapter, verse 15, we read, For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. Of course, this was a quotation from the Old Testament, and this was said by Jesus in the New Testament. So that's been a problem all throughout uh, recorded history. Now, we, in our prayer, should pray for hearts that are inclined to the truth. We're willing to be uh, persuaded by the truth. In verse 12, <clears throat> for by this time you ought to be teachers, and I might say that 
it is the duty of, of all Christians to become qualified to be teachers of the Word of God. Now, I know that some people just, just don't have the aptitude to, to stand in front of people and talk somebody to sleep. <laughs> but, but, but I can do that. So. <laughs> so. But you ought to qualify yourself, at least uh, in, the, in the area of knowledge, to be able to be a teacher. And that was the problem with these people. And you consider that, uh, you know, the church was established, say, let's just say uh, A.D. 33. And the time that this was written is somewhere mid-60s A.D. Let's say roughly 30 years, been 30 years. And they, hadn't, they didn't have any teachers. <laughs> By that time, they didn't have any teachers. Uh, they ought to have been able to not only teach the rudiments, and we'll, you know, he'll say that, teach the rudiments, but they ought to be able to teach the more profound aspects of the uh, Christian religion. He says, by this time you ought to be teaching, but you're not. You need someone else to teach you, again, the first principles of the oracles of God. They'd even forgotten the uh, rudiments. They, they couldn't teach the rudiments. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. Of course, these are great uh, metaphors because we all understand those things. A bountiful harvest is not uh, possible without sowing the seed. It seems that uh, many people experience a crop failure because they never plant the seed. <clears throat> and there's no use to look for the fruit of the Spirit in barren ground. You remember the explanation of the uh, parable of the soils? You might want to re reread that. That's you know what's been talked about here. Let, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace, in your hearts to the Lord. That's in Colossians 3.16. And there's one verse that comes right after it, and right up there. In verse 13, for everyone who takes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. Uh, that's the gospel. For he is a babe. Now we know that in you know, the, the physical world, we don't feed T-bone steak to babes. Of course, in the days of environment, you can hardly feed it to yourself. <laughs> but uh, you don't feed that kind of food to babies. <clears throat> of course, you may have to if you can't get powdered milk, but <laughs> milk baby formula. But, any, but anyway, that's another discussion for another day. He says in verse 14, but solid food, and, and again, these are metaphors for the things spiritual, so that's, it's really talking about the, the deeper things of Scripture. The solid food belongs to those who are of full age. Now, we know those of full age are the ones who can handle uh, solid food, not, not babes. So, but we're not really talking about, you know, physical food. We're talking about spiritual food, so this... Uh, full age has to be the spiritual age. They're not mature spiritually. That is, those who by reason of use, and again, the metaphor is uh, uh, appropriate for Christians, we must practice and study uh, Scripture. We must study uh, Christianity and so forth. So those who by reason of use, practice and study, have their senses the senses are the, the faculties of uh, discrimination and discernment. You know, you read something, you can discriminate between one thing that's been said and another, contrast and comparison, sometimes we say. Uh, but have their senses exercised, and that's uh, trained, uh, that's uh, used have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You've got to learn them both. 
you have to be able to recognize both of them. You have to learn, uh, you know, learning either increases knowledge or uh, the ability to discern. Or if you don't study, you lose it. Learning, if you don't learn anything, you look at anything that you may have is lost. Therefore, in uh, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. Now, keep in mind that all uh, disciplines have uh, elementary principles, but they also have more advanced knowledge. You know, we always talk about, you know, I, I, I'm a, not a rocket scientist. <laughs> But even rocket science has its elementary principles, but it's had more advanced knowledge too. So any discipline has that. The more advanced uh, knowledge builds on the elementary knowledge. You know, one thing builds on another. Uh, fundamentals are necessary, but um, these people had not mastered the uh, fundamentals, and therefore they were not prepared or equipped or uh, had an increase in knowledge of divine things. It was totally, totally lacking on their part. He goes on to say, let us go on to perfection. Now, again, perfection doesn't mean without sin. It means suitable to the use of uh, whatever they're engaged in, adequately supplied for what they need. So not laying again the foundation of... Uh, now he's going to go into the elementary principles here, foundation of repentance. That's a change of mind, uh, you know, cease to do evil and learn to do, do good. And you, you can look at uh, Isaiah, the first chapter, verse 16, the second part of 16 and the first part of 17. And also 2 Corinthians 7, chapter, verse 9 through 11. I'll read that one. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow had led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing that you that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligent it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Now you might say that, uh, well, of course Paul was addressing the Corinthians, that they may have been in the same position as the Hebrew Christians. Uh, they had a lot of problems there too, but both the Hebrew Christians and the Corinthian Christians both had uh, obeyed uh, Christ. They had been baptized. They were uh, at least initially in a saving condition, but they're both in uh, danger of being lost. Now, repentance, and I'll read the rest of the uh, verse in a minute, but repentance can be summarized as a change of understanding from what is learned. After that is a change of conviction by the change of understanding. And once that happens, it's a change of the will growing out of the change of conviction. And finally, it's a change of conduct growing out of the change of will. That is a, a series of things that must happen in repentance. And he goes on to say uh, repentance and uh, from dead works and a, a faith towards God. Now the will of the sinner must be subject wholly to the will of, of uh, God. In Acts 3rd uh, chapter, verse 19, we read, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that is, turn again. And I think ASV says that. 
that your sin may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So he continues those elementary principles uh, of the doctrines of baptisms. Now let's, let's, let's dwell on that for a moment. Uh, you know, Ephesians uh, 4 verse 5 says there's just one bapti- baptism, but he says the doctrine of baptisms, plural. So what can he be talking about? There's only one baptism now. What baptism, what baptism is he talking about? Well, there's a number of baptisms mentioned in the uh, Bible and New Testament. There's a baptism of John. Uh, there's a baptism of Jewish proselytes. There's divers, the Jewish washings, washings, which were also called baptism. There's baptism of the Holy Spirit. Is the baptism of fire. And now the one baptism. That's the baptism in water. And then let's see where these, uh, so these the baptism in water is mentioned. Acts 8, 36. And as they went down the road, they came to this Ethiopian eunuch, of course, came down to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? So we know that's the baptism in water. Matthew 3.11, he said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. And this is John talking, so this is John's baptism. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit in fire. There's two other baptisms. And Mark 1.8 says, uh, similarly, I, I baptize, indeed baptize you with the water, but that's John, and he will but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And in like Acts 11, 11, 16, it says, Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John, indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Of course, this John baptism, this baptized with the Holy Spirit, is talking to uh, really his disciples. They receive the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit. We, we do not. <clears throat> Luke 3.16, John answered again and saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. <clears throat> and, and again, Acts 19.3 uh, says, Into what were you then baptized? And said John's baptism. But now there's one baptism. In Ephesians 4th chapter, verses 3 through 16, he says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now, if there is more than one baptism, then there is more than one body, there's more than one spirit, and there's more than one hope, and there's more than one faith, and there's more than one God and Father of us all. Now, we would never agree to that, so there is only one baptism. And he goes on to say, but to each of you, uh, each one of us, grace and was given according to the measure of God's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captive. Captain and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, does it mean that he also first descended in the lower parts of the earth? He who had descended is also the one who ascended far above the heaven, that he might fill all things. And he gave himself some to be apostles. We are not all things to all men. Gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and then pastors is the same word that's used to describe elders. The pastor is not the preacher. The preacher is the evangelist. And some pastors and teachers <clears throat> for the equipping of saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to 
to a perfect man, that's a complete man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning of craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love and that uh, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head of Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by whatever joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share and causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And this is what the Hebrew Christians were not doing. And this is what we, we should be doing. <clears throat> In Revelation uh, 22, verse 11, it says, He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him uh, holy be holy still. Now, this is saying that there are those who are talking to Christians who become unjust. If they're going to stay unjust, just let them stay unjust. And filthy, that's not talking about bodily filth. It's talking about spiritual filth. They become filthy. Let them stay filthy. If that's, if that's their mind, let them stay that way. But he who is righteous, determined to be righteous, control the tongue, say, let him be righteous. And holy, of course, let him be holy still. And verse 3 of uh, chapter 6, and this we will do uh, if God permits. That is, we will go on to perfection. But in order to do that, we must submit to God's will. For it is impossible uh, that hearts hardened by sin, they're not able to be brought to repentance. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, and uh, I'll be reading something uh, down here below uh, if we get to it. Well, I may not. Uh, once enlightened in, in uh, Ephesians 5, 8 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light, and the Lord walk as children of light. did mean you always will, but... Walks children in light. In 6 Timothy uh, uh, one ten. but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to life through the Gospels. So that's being enlightened. And have tasted, and again, it's a, it's a metaphor, and that means you, you've experienced this, have tasted the heavenly gift, that is, the uh, new life in Christ, and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Now, this describes the uh, Hebrew Christians. And down in, in uh, verse uh, 5, he says, And have tasted, and that is, again, experienced and enjoyed, the good word of God and the power of the age to come. Now, only the faithful can experience and enjoy this. In verse 6, it says, if they fall away. Now, I must uh, warn you that if in the uh, New King James is supplied, it is not in the Greek. And the ASV is probably a better translation. It's, instead of if they fall away and then fall away, if uh, has the idea that it may, may or may not happen, but here... It has happened, and then fall away. That's the aorist tense, so it should be, in English, should be a past tense. You have fallen away. If they have fallen away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God. The hardened apostate, uh, they would crucify again by denying him again, and they put him to open shame. Uh, enlightened, here enlightened and tasted or heirs also, that's uh, as in fall away. So all these things have already happened. Now if apostasy is, as the said, were impossible, 
then why was this epistle written? Now, if you are familiar with the, uh, the TULIP acronym, uh, that has to do with uh, the, the elect, the elect, you're saved, you can't do anything about it. It didn't matter uh, how you live your life. If you're the elect, you're saved. And if you're the best person that you could ever be and you're not the elect, you're lost, just, just the way it is. <clears throat> so the question has to be asked, if, if that were the case, why is this epistle written? If it's not possible for the saved to be lost, why was this epistle, this epistle written? There was a uh, <clears throat> comment made uh, about this on the this whole subject. Dean Alford, he's a, uh, uh, a religious writer long ago. He, he died long ago. He makes the following very just and critical remarks. In later times, a great combat over our passage has been between Calvinistic and Armenian expositors. And you'll just have to go read those, find out what they are. To favor the peculiar views of indefectibility, now that's uh, inability to fail or be lost. And I might say the Calvinist uh, doctrine has permeated most of the denominations in some form or fashion. They have different uh, aspects of it. Uh, I guess the most common one is once saved, always saved. You can't, can't be lost once you're saved. But uh, he says, to favor the peculiar, peculiar views of indefectibility, once saved, always saved, the former have endeavored to weaken the force of the participial, participial clauses as implying any real participation in the spiritual life. So Calvin, Beza, Owen, Tate, and others, uh, they have hold that view. Owen says the persons here intended are not true and sincere believers. How does he know that? For, their, for in their full and large description, there is no mention of faith or believing. But uh, Alfred goes on to say, this is, all this is clearly wrong and contrary to the plainest sense of the terms used here. The writer even, he, no, that's Owen, the writer even heaps clause upon clause to show that no, no such shallow tasting no mere tasting, and you know, having tasted the good word of God, no mere tasting with the top of the lips is intended. And the whole contextual argument is against this, uh, the view, for it is the very fact that these persons having veritably, that, that is, can be proven or verified, have veritably entered into the spiritual life. In other words, they were redeemed, they were saved. He goes on to say, which makes it impossible to renew them again, renew them afresh if they shall fall away. If they have never entered it, if they are unregenerate, what possible logic is it, or even common sense at all, to say that their shallow taste and partial apprehension makes it impossible to renew them? And what again to say that is impossible to renew again persons in whose case no renewal has ever taken place? If they never have believed, never have been regenerated, how can it be more difficult to renew them to repentance than the heathen or any unregenerate, unregenerate person? Our land of exegesis must be to hold fast the plain, simple sense of the pa passage and recognize in the fact that the persons are truly the partakers of the spiritual life, regenerate by the Holy Spirit. These critical reasonings and observations are not to be gainsaid, that is, denied or contradicted. They are, in fact, wholly unanswerable. But how painful it is after all this to hear from the same learned author such unauthorized remarks as the following, elect of course, they are not, or they could not fall away, perseverance of the saints, by the very force of the term. But this is one among many passages where in the scriptures, as ever from the teaching of the church, we learn that elect and regenerate are not convertible terms. 
That's what this fellow is saying. All elect are regenerate, but all regenerate are not elect. I mean, you could uh, uh, confess your sins, repent of them, and all that stuff, but if you're not elect, you're not regenerate. <clears throat> the regenerate may fall away. The elect never can. Once saved, always saved. And Alfred goes on to say, Here the learned Arthur certainly attempts to make a groundless distinction. Where in the scriptures is it taught that some of the regenerate are not elect? It's not mentioned. And, and Dean Alford was an able critic, but in his theologi theological speculations, he frequently, frequently errs. Equally strange and absurd, absurd is the hypothesis that the good of uh, the good and venerable Albert Barnes. Now, we, uh, if you have uh, commentaries, you probably have him. He says, the passage proves that if true believers uh, should apostatize, that if, that if true believers should apostatize, it would be impossible to renew and save them. That's what it says. <laughs> if then it should be asked whether I believe that any true Christian, again, you have to understand what a Calvinist thinks a true Christian is, that any true Christian ever did or ever, ever will fall from grace and wholly lose his religion, I would answer unhesitantly, no. And the writer of this particular article says, why then all this earnest warning about a matter which never did occur and which from the very nature of the case never can occur? Why spend our time in solemn warning uh, the people to beware lest the heavens fall? If by the decrees and ordinances of Jehovah it is made impossible that they ever can fall. And those are very uh, apropos comments about the whole tenor of, of the uh, epistle of Hebrews. It is because the elect could fall that this uh, epistle was written. We'll take this up in verse 7, 6, 7 next time. <clears throat>